Yes. Okay, as we mentioned, uh, Apostle James is linking four pretty important concepts, persevering trials, the crown of life, and those who love him. And what is the apostle telling us? He's telling us what we should do, when we should do it, what's the reward or the blessing that we'll receive from doing it, and what is the motivation for doing it. And so the Apostle James is actually giving us a nice, neat little formula for being approved by the Lord. Now, after God had delivered the nation of Israel from Egyptian bondage, he, he led them to Mount Sinai, and he offered them a tremendous opportunity as recorded for us in Exodus, the 19th chapter, beginning with verse 4. He said, You yourselves have seen what I've done to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' winds and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that the Lord shall speak to the sons of Israel. So what God was offering to the nation of Israel was an opportunity to become the spiritual seed of the Abrahamic promise and to become that anatypical Melchizedek priesthood that would bless all the families of the earth, that would fulfill the promise made to Abraham. The Lord had offered to the nation really a great opportunity to become the body of the Christ. But the people would have to do two things first to inherit this promise. First, they would have to obey God's voice and keep his covenant. And to do that, they would have to love the Lord with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their might to accomplish this. They would have to love God with everything that they had. And during the next 40 years in the wilderness, God tested Israel, whether or not they would obey God's voice, whether or not they would keep his covenant, and would they love him with all of their heart, mind, and soul? The answer was no, and that generation died in the wilderness. Forty years later, as a new generation of Israelites was preparing to enter the promised land, these same requirements were really set before them through the words of Moses, beginning in Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, and verse one. Now, this is the commandment the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it. Before Moses left the scene, God had a mission for Moses, to instruct the people regarding their responsibilities upon entering the promised land. And so Moses continues in those instructions in verse four. He says, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These are the words that I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You know, this statement gave a new generation of Israelites really two vital truths that was to guide their conduct as they entered the promised land. First, the Lord their God was one. He was one being, he was new, unique, unlike the gods that other nations had. And his glory he would not give to another. God was to reign supreme in the lives of his people. And to do this, they would need to love the Lord their God with all their heart or affection, with all their soul or life, and all, with all their might or strength. And loving their God supremely was vital, not only to their su success, in taking possession of the promised land, but also success in inheriting that great opportunity that the Lord had set before the nation of Israel 40 years before of becoming a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This love for God was so critical that Jesus, when he was questioned by a Jewish lawyer about what was the greatest commandment of the law, reached back to these words of Moses so many years before, when he said in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 38, he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. However, when 
Moses had given these words to Israel so many years before, he also gave them a warning. He told them that God would test their love to see if it was genuine and all-encompassing. He stated that over time, there would be false teachers that would be arise to try to lead Israel astray. And when this was happening, he says in, in Deuteronomy, the 13th chapter in verse three, he says, the Lord God was actually testing them to see if they would love the Lord their God with all their heart and with all their soul. Now, Israel was only to follow the Lord their God and his appointed judges and prophets and teachers, and finally his son. But God would test them to see whether or not they were willing to do that, whether they would be true to his commandment and follow the Lord and love him with his entire heart. And so he then, he, uh, Moses goes on in verse four and he says, you shall follow the Lord your God and fear him. You shall keep his commandments and listen to his voice, serve him and cling to him. That was what the nation of Israel needed to do to inherit the land and the promise. And the path that they would follow would really reveal the extent of their love for God, whether it was genuine and whether it was all encompassing. You know, this same requirement to love God supremely has been given to us, the Gentiles, who've been offered the opportunity to replace those unfaithful Israelites and inherit the promise to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You know, the Apostle John wrote to us in 1 John, the, the fifth chapter in verse three, he says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. You know, our love for God is demonstrated by keeping his commandments, his statutes, his instructions to us. In fact, God is giving us the very exact same test that he gave to the nation of Israel. And John adds in 1 John 2, verse 5, he says, but whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. You know, keeping God's word not only shows that we love him, but shows that the love that God has has been replicated in our hearts. And that brings us to 2 Thessalonians, the, first, uh, the third chapter in verse 5, where the Apostle Paul makes a connection between our love for God and the subject of perseverance with these words. He says, may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness or perseverance of Christ. You know, here Paul is linking love and perseverance because like the Israelites, God will test us. He will test our love for him to make sure it is genuine and all-consuming. This brings us back to our theme text of James 1.12, where the word perseveres is translated from Strong's word number 5278, upam, upam no. It's a compound word, and it means to stay under. That is to undergo, to bear trials, to have fortitude and to persevere. It's a verb and we find it 17 times in the New Testament. And Thayer's definition of the Greek word adds the following to it. It means to remain, to abide, not to recede or flee and to preserve under misfortunes and trials, to hold fast to one's faith in Christ. And so persevering really means to hold fast to one's face in Christ under difficult experiences, under misfortunes and trials. And in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter in verse seven, the apostle Paul links persevering together with love as love really be, is the impetus for persevering. 1 Corinthians 13, seven, the apostle writes, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures or perseveres all things. In fact, love, divine or agape love, is the motivation for persevering. The importance of persevering to be approved and to win the crown of life is emphasized really throughout the scriptures, particularly the New Testament. Remember what our Lord said in Matthew 10, 22? He says, you'll be hated of all because of my name, but the one who endures, the one who perseveres to the end, that one will be saved. 
you know, our course in following the footsteps of Jesus will put us out of harmony and really in conflict with the rest of the world. And we will have to persevere through the hatred of the world, through the hatred of the adversary, and through all the conflict this creates in our lives in order to obtain the spiritual salvation promise. You know, the Apostle Paul talks about this in 2 Timothy, the second chapter, and verses 10 and verse 12, where he says these words. He says, for this reason I endure or persevere all things for the sake of those who are chosen so that they may also obtain salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. And then he adds in verse 12, if we persevere, we will also reign with him. You know, the apostle Paul persevered through much persecution and much opposition in his Christian life, not just to obtain his own salvation, but so that his brethren could also secure their salvation. And so in this regard, the apostle Paul is a great example for us of what we should do. We should endure all things for the sake of our brethren. The Apostle Paul also adds in Romans 12, verse 12, that we are to persevere through tribulation, because as we're told in Acts 14, 22, it is through much tribulation that we will enter the kingdom of God. Now, we find the noun form of this same Greek word, apomeno, used even more frequently in the New Testament to describe this endurance, this perseverance that we must have to show our love for our Heavenly Father and to win the crown of life. This noun form of the word is Strong's numbers 5281, upamine, and it really means cheerful or hopeful endurance or constancy. Now we find this word 32 times in the New Testament, and Thayer's adds the following regarding the definition of this Greek word. He says it means steadfastness, constancy or endurance. It, it is really the characteristic of a man who's not swerved from his deliberate purpose and from his loyalty and loyalty to faith and piety, even by the greatest trials and sufferings. It also describes a patient and steadfast waiting for something that's to come in the future. You know, this word sort of adds the thought of cheerful or hopeful to this idea of endurance or perseverance. So it's, it's done in a hopeful manner, not done on a begrudge, begrud, begrudging basis. You know, and Jesus emphasized the importance of this cheerful endurance or this cheerful perseverance in Luke 21, verse 19, where he said, by your endurance or perseverance, you will gain your lives. The importance of cheerful endurance or perseverance to, wear, to win the crown of life is emphasized many times for us in the scriptures. For example, the apostle Paul wrote in Hebrews, the 10th chapter in verse 36, he said, for you have need of endurance or cheerful endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. You know, we'll need cheerful perseverance to do the will of God in face of the opposition of our three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. You know, remember that the will of God is, con is in conflict with all three of these, and it, will take, and it will take cheerful endurance to be victorious in this conflict. The Apostle Paul adds in Romans 8 and verse 25, he says, but if we hope for that which we do not see with perseverance, with cheerful endurance, we wait eagerly for it. Our hope of being of the little flock, of being kings and priests, is not really sane. It's beyond the veil. It is spiritual, and therefore it is by perseverance that we eagerly wait for the fulfillment of our hopes. You know, the Apostle Paul praised the brethren at Thessalonica for their perseverance when he said in 1 Thessalonians 1, 3, he says, and he commends the brethren, he says, they're constantly bearing in mind your work of faith your labor of love, and your steadfastness or your cheerful perseverance of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, together with faith and love, perseverance or cheerful endurance for the hope of Christ is critical to making our calling election sure. Notice how all three of these words are really active 
You know, it's the work of faith and it's the labor of love. And it's also the work that we put forth into steadfast or cheerful perseverance that helps us be successful in our Christian walk. Now, the Apostle Paul tells us that perseverance is a critical part of our Christian character. When he describes that character for us in 2 Peter, the first chapter, and verses 5 through 8. You know, before perseverance, the Apostle Paul mentions four aspects of that Christian character. He says in verses 5 and 6, he says, in your faith, supply moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, and then perseverance. Perseverance, you notice, follows self-control. It is self-control that enables us to cheerfully endure and be persistent, to, be, uh, to persevere in the face of trials and difficulties and opposition and all the challenges that await us as we walk in the footsteps of Jesus. After perseverance, the Apostle Peter mentions three more characteristics. He mentions in verses 6 and 7, and in your perseverance supply godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. They're all parts of the Christian character that come from perseverance. They come from the application of perseverance along the lines of doing God's will in our Christian walk. And so perseverance is really critical for the development of these characteristics. Now, the Apostle Paul told us about how perseverance or cheerful endurance comes about in the development of our Christian character. And he tells us that in Romans, the fifth chapter, and beginning with verse three. He says, and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Now it's counterintuitive to the natural man to exult in tribulations because Tribulations bring difficulty. They bring angst and pain and sufferings, and, and they make life difficult. But the new creature in Christ Jesus exalts in tribulations because it requires perseverance, part of the Christian character, to overcome them. And so as Paul goes on in verse 4, he says, and perseverance results in proven character, and proven character Proven character comes from perseverance, and that character is the character likeness of our Lord Jesus. That's what, and developing that character is what leads to our achieving our spiritual hope of glory, honor, and immortality. In fact, the Apostle Paul writes about this in the same epistle to the Romans, in Romans 2 and verse 7, where he says, it is to those who by perseverance in doing good or in doing God's will, seek for glory, honor, and immortality, eternal life. It's by perseverance. It's by cheerful endurance that we seek for the crown of life, that we seek for to be part of the little flock, the bride of Christ, part of God's divine family and ultimate, that kingdom of priests and that holy nation. The Apostle James in his message leading up to our theme text, describes the same relationship that Paul just did, the same relationship between trials, perseverance, and the development of Christian character. He writes in James 1, beginning with verse 2, he says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. You know, again, while this is counterintuitive to the natural man, the new creature understands the necessity for trials. He goes on and says, knowing that the testing of your faith and also the testing of our love produces endurance. It requires cheerful endurance or perseverance for us to triumph in these testing experiences. And then he goes on in verse four and says, let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You know, the result of this cheerful endurance or perseverance is that we may become complete as a new creature in Christ Jesus, fully developed, grow up into our head, which is our head, even Christ. And the importance of perseverance in this character development was also mentioned by our Lord Jesus in the parable of the sower. 
when explaining the parable to his disciples, Jesus said this in Luke 18 and verse 15, he said, but the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with patience. The successful Christian brings forth the fruit of the spirit, the character likeness of our Lord Jesus, but it takes perseverance to do that to completion. You know, the apostle Paul in the book of Hebrews in the 12th chapter makes a very special connection between perseverance and character over development with these words beginning in verse five. He said, and he was talking to the brethren, he says, you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure or persevere. God deals with you as with sons, for what son is there whom a father does not discipline? You know, in this passage, the Apostle Paul is actually quoting from the Old Testament. He's quoting from the book of Proverbs about the importance of discipline and the fact that we should not loathe discipline, but we should accept it as really an evidence of God's love for us. He's quoting from Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12, where Solomon writes, my son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. You know, the thought that the Apostle Paul is trying to convey to us and to the Hebrew brethren was that discipline is for correction. It's for instruction and in righteousness. And perseverance is needed so that we don't faint under these experiences because sometimes they can be very challenging. You know, this disciplining is also part of the pruning process by which one is to bring forth more spiritual fruit. We remember what our Lord said when he talked about the, the, the illustration of the vine and the branches in John the 15th chapter. He said in verse two of John 15, he said, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, God takes away. But every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it, will, so that it may bear more fruit. You know, this disciplining or these pruning expense, experiences is that evidence is God's love for that individual. And not only his love, but his great desire for them to be successful in this development, to, to put on the Christian character to, to full maturity and to win the crown of life. And perseverance is critical to enduring, to not fainting when we are pruned, when we are disciplined, even when we are scourged by the Lord. Going back to Paul's words in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, Paul concludes with the, his thought with these verses, Hebrews 12, verses 11 and 12. He says, he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. You know, this discipline that Paul's been talking about it yields the fruit of righteousness, the, the fruit of the spirit or the Christian character, but it takes perseverance, cheerful endurance on our part to, to basically go through these experiences, to, to not be consumed with the difficulty they, they create in our lives, not to faint from the discipline, but learn the lessons that the Lord intends for us in these experiences. So where does perseverance come from? The Apostle Paul gives us an answer to this question, Romans, the 15th chapter, beginning with verse 4. He says, whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance 
and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So now in verse five, he continues. So then now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. Perseverance comes from God. And Paul tells us here, he, it comes to us in two different ways. First, God provides perseverance through the scriptures, as he mentions in verse 4. The scriptures tell us what perseverance is, the importance of making it part of our character. He tells us why it's needed. And then it, he gives us through the scriptures examples who have demonstrated this in their lives and who can be role models for us. Secondly, God gives us perseverance in a much more direct way, as he mentions in verse 5, through his power, through his Holy Spirit, through his overruling providences. And this is what Paul was referring to in his prayer for the Colossian brethren, which is recorded for us in Colossians, the first chapter in verse 11. He says Paul's prayer for the brethren there was to be strengthened with all might, or excuse me, with all power, according to God's glorious might, for the attaining of all perseverance, and patience joyously. You know, God, through the might of his spirit, through his overruling pro providences, helps us develop, helps us gain perseverance and patience cheerfully so that we can face the trial of our faith. So how does perseverance come to us from the scriptures? Paul tells us about this in Hebrews 12 and verse 1. He says, Therefore, since we have been surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every encumbrance, the sin which so easily entangles yeah. us, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. You know, the race we're running is a marathon, and we need endurance to make it to the end of the race. Remember the, the, the words that our Lord said, he who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. So we need to endure, and, and so we need perseverance to be successful in this marathon. And just prior to this verse, the apostle has spent the, 11th, the entire 11th chapter of Hebrews reviewing the Hebrews of faith, the heroes of faith. He's, he's talked to us about Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and many others. And he says we are surrounded by these witnesses, and so we should follow their example of perseverance in our Christian walk. In essence, this is one of the reasons why their story has been recorded for us in the scripture, and, and in many cases, in quite a lot of detail, so that we can see their perseverance and copy it in our lives. And then the apostle in Hebrews 12 goes on to mention the next two verses, the greatest example of perseverance found in the scriptures. That is our Lord Jesus. And so he writes in verse 2 and 3, he talks specifically about how Jesus persevered the trial of his faith and love for God. Verse 2, he says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him persevered the cross, disregarding the shame and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has persevered such hostility of sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You know, in these two verses, he tells us Jesus persevered the cross of Christ. He persevered the hostility of sinners. And so in this way, Jesus is a great role model for us to follow. He mentions, he goes on and confirms this in Philippians, the second chapter in verse eight, where he says that Jesus being found in appearance as a man humbled himself by becoming obedient unto the point of death, the death of the cross. You know, Jesus' perseverance, his endurance led him to be obedient unto the death of the cross. That showed that his love for God was, was genuine and was all consuming. And this verse also brings another thing to our attention, and that is the importance of humility in persevering, of accepting and being obedient to God's will, no matter the circumstance he brings into our life. You know, we see Jesus' willingness to be this ransom sacrifice 
for Father Adam expressed by Paul in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, and beginning with verse 5, where he writes, Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. You know, Jesus delighted to do God's will because as David expressed it in Psalms, the 40th chapter and verse seven and eight, he says, I delight to do thy will, O my God, your law is within my heart. You know, it was Jesus' delight or really his love for God's will together with his humility that led to his endurance, his perseverance, even unto the death of the cross. And the same will be true of us. It will take our delight or our love for God and his will, together with humility on our part, to copy the perseverance of Jesus. Remember the verse we quoted earlier from 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 5? May the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness or the perseverance of Christ. Following in the example of Jesus is the way that we do this. We find Jesus' perseverance even unto death, mentioned by the Apostle Paul, again in the book of Hebrews, but this time in chapter 2, beginning with verse 9. But we see him, who was a little lower than the, who was made for a little while, lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for every man. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. You know, this verse brings to our attention a second reason for Jesus' earthly ministry, to prepare him to be that great merciful high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Perseverance enabled Jesus to be made complete or perfect through sufferings. And, and that's what the Apostle Paul expresses really quite succinctly in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verses eight through 10. But this we would like to read from Phillips. But son though he was, Jesus had to prove the meaning of obedience through all that he suffered. Then when he had been proved the perfect son, he became the source of salvation to all who should obey him, being designated by God himself as high priest after the order of Melchizedek. You know, it was Jesus' perseverance in doing God's will faithfully unto death that proved him the perfect son and qualified him to be the author of eternal salvation to all who should obey him. You know, great, Jesus' great perseverance is shown not only in how he handled the difficult experiences that he handled, his, his crucifixion, the hostility of sinners, but it's also shown in how carefully, careful he was to always do God's will and speak the Father's words. For example, when speaking of his death, he said in John the eighth chapter, beginning with verse 28, he said, he said, when you lift up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak the things as the Father has taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He's not left me alone. For I always do the things that are pleasing to him. You know, Jesus had no will of his own, no initiative of his own. He did the Father's will. As he said concerning the Father's words in, in John 12, verses 49 and 50, he says, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. You know, just as Jesus understood that the commandment of the Father was eternal life, and so he was careful only to speak and do the things that the Father had told him, we need to speak and act in accordance with the will of God 
as well. And we will need perseverance to do that. You know, the followers of Jesus need perseverance for exactly the same reasons that Jesus did. To be faithful in their sacrifice unto death. And, and we're told about this in Revelation, the second chapter, verse 2 and 3, where we're told about the perseverance of the early church represented in the church of Ephesus. There John wrote, Romans, excuse me, Revelation 2, verse 2 and 3, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance. You have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. That's the example we need to follow. The Apostle Paul also praised the brethren at Thessalonica for their perseverance in the face of difficult experiences in 2 Thessalonians 1, 4. He said, and we speak proudly among the churches for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. Second, perseverance is needed so that we can be developed as part of that merciful priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. As the apostle John wrote about the perseverance in the church of Thyatira, Revelation 2 verse 19, he says, I know your deeds and your love and your faith and your service and your perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than those at first. You know, perseverance is essential for the development of all the things he mentions in that verse. Development of love, the manifestation of service, and the, and the manifestation of faith. And perseverance is essential for us if we are not to become weary in well-doing, in sowing to the Spirit. As Paul writes in Galatians 4 and verses 8 and 9, he says, The one who sows to the Spirit will from of the Spirit reap life eternal. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we don't grow weary. Perseverance is essential for us not to grow weary in the doing of good. So in addition to the scriptures, how does God help us in the development of perseverance? Paul tells us about this in Ephesians, the sixth chapter in verse 10, where he says, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And then he tells us how to do that. He says, put on the full armor of God so that we'll be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the wickedness of this, of this present evil world, against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, he says, take unto you the full armor of God so that we, you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand. You know, God gives us the armor of truth, the spiritual armor, so that we can be protected against the wiles of the adversary. He gives us the girdle of truth and the breastplate of righteousness, the sandals of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. He gives us the privilege of prayer. He gives us all of these tools, all of these tools, so that we can be prepared to uh, overcome uh, the, 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 the enemies and the difficult experiences that we will face. Now, going back to James, the apostle links together perseverance or endurance and trials. Remember what he said at the beginning of the chapter, James 1, verses 2 and 3. He says, consider it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And then in our theme text, he says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. So what are the trials? connected with perseverance or endurance that James is talking about. You know, these trials are tests of our, our love for God, his son, and his truth, which we've talked about. They're trials of faith in God and his promises, well, whether we will stay loyal to him. They're tests of character, of the character likeness of our Lord, Savior, Christ Jesus, and of loyalty to God and his truth. You know, the apostle describes the impact of these tests and their ultimate objective in 2 Corinthians 4 and verses 16 and 17, where he says, therefore, we do not lose heart 
but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For the momentary light affliction is producing for us <clears throat> an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comprehension. You know, our trials are a day-to-day -day test of our love for God, of our faith in God, of our character likeness of our Lord Jesus and our loyalty to God and his principles of truth and righteousness. And many of those experiences include elements of all four by which our Lord is proving our worthiness for eternal life. You know, Brother Russell describes the relationship between these trials and tests and our perseverance in reprint 3104, which is titled, Who is Worthy? He says these words. He says, the Lord is seeking his precious jewels. Many of them indeed are diamonds in the rough. And a real diamond is a noble, loyal, faithful character, devoted and uncompromising in its allegiance to God. God's eye is on them. Character is what he's looking for. And in due time, when the character is sufficiently developed, confirmed, tested, and proved worthy of exaltation, he can and will add to it all the glories of knowledge, wisdom, grace, and beauty. But first, he will subject it to all the necessary tests. And then he adds, nothing so gloriously reflects the light as a diamond, and nothing so gloriously reflects the truth as the worthy character of the true and faithful saint. You know, this brings us back to our theme text. For the English word translated trial is Strong's number 3986, and it means putting to the proof, experience, discipline, or adversary. And Thayer's adds to this definition, it's the trial of a man's fidelity integrity, virtue, and constancy. He adds that it is difficult experiences, whether they're adversities or afflictions or troubles sent by God, and which seek to test or prove one's character, one's faith, and one's holiness. Trial is really an experience that puts to the proof regarding our integrity, our character, and our loyalty to God. You know, our Lord Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, the very early part of his ministry, talked about trials, talked about how we would be blessed by them. In Matthew, the fifth chapter, beginning with verse 10, he said, blessed are those who have been persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men will insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. He says, rejoice and be glad for great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You know, Jesus said, we're going to have these kinds of experiences because we are endeavoring to do God's will. And that puts us out of harmony with everything else in this present evil world. And so Jesus added on the last night of his earthly life, he said in John 15, 18, he says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. The world, the flesh, the adversary, they'll not welcome our efforts to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, to be conformed to his character likeness. The darkness hates the light, and hence they will oppose us and fight us at every opportunity. Brother Russell continues to describe this relationship between these trials and tests in our perseverance in reprint 3104 when he says, another way of testing a diamond is to put it under pressure. And if it's a real diamond, it will stand the pressure. For the diamond is the hardest substance known. But if it's not a real diamond, it will go to pieces and thus prove itself spurious. So God allows us to come under the constant pressure of years of toil and care and sacrifice to see how we will endure and blessed is the diamond-proved character that endures to the end. You know, the Apostle Paul spoke of the lifetime of pressure that he endured in 2 Corinthians 11th chapter, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 11th chapter, beginning with verse 24. He talked about being lashed five times. 
He talked about being beaten with rods thrice, being stoned once. Three times he was shipwrecked in a day and a night he spent in the deep. He talked about his, fever, his frequent journeys, the dangers he suffered from rivers and robbers, his countrymen and the Gentiles, the dangers in the city and the wilderness, the dangers amongst false brethren. You know, Paul suffered a whole lifetime of experiences in his ministry to the gospel. He goes on in verse 27 and says he's been in labor and in hardship through sleepless nights, hunger and thirsting. And apart from this, the daily pressure on him, the concern of the churches. Paul wrote about all the experiences that he went through. And so this was part of the pressure of the trials upon him. And he is an example for us of all of these kind of experiences. You know, he bore the heavy responsibility of the brethren in day, and that was part of his trial. You know, and while most of us will not face the life-threatening experiences that Paul had in preaching and promoting and reflecting the gospel, we'll, we'll still face similar challenges in our day-to-day -day walk in the footsteps of Jesus. In letting our light shine in our life, lives through what we say and do. We will, face, we will face trials. We will face hardship. It'll take time and energy and effort to basically let our light shine, just like it did the Apostle Paul. But our trials and experiences are more than just persecution. They're more than just near-death experiences. They're also tests of our love and our loyalty to the Lord in many different ways. You know, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, he says, no temptation has overtaken you, but such is this common to man. So what are some of the trials that are common to man? Well, Paul talks about those, and he brings them to us from Israel's testing by God in the wilderness, and he exhorts us to not make the same mistakes they did. Going back to verse 6, he says, now these things happened as an example for us, that we would not crave the same things that Israel did. You know, Israel is an example of the kind of tests we will face and also of how not to respond to those tests. He said, don't be idolaters, as some of them were. You know, one of our tests will be along the lines of idolatry. Will we worship God more than anything else? He says, don't let us act immorally, as some of them did. Another test that we will face is morality or integrity. Do we follow the principles of truth and righteousness even to our own fleshly disadvantage? Nor let us tempt the Lord as some of them did because they were not happy with their situation. Nor let us not grumble as some of them did about our experiences complaining to the Lord that we don't like the trial, we don't like the pruning experience that we're going through. All of these happen to them as examples. And we should be expect to be tested in similar ways. This brings us then to the second part of James, the first chapter in verse 12, where he says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been improved, he will receive the crown of life. So what does that mean? You know, those that have been proved, those who have shown that their love for God is genuine and all-consuming. They love him with all their heart, with all their life, with all their might, and with all their mind. And they'll receive the promised reward, the crown of life. You know, Apostle John writes about that crown of life in Revelation 2.10. He says, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Peter mentions it in 1 Peter 5.4. He says, when the chief shepherd will appear, you will receive a crown of unfading glory. And Paul talks about that crown in 2 Timothy 4, 8, where he says, there is a crown of righteousness laid up for him. But not only him, but all those who love his appearing. And so Paul is again sort of bringing this concept of the crown or the reward back with the concept of love. And it's our love for God that results in winning this crown of life. You know, in the book of Romans, Paul explains to us really what this crown is. And he links it 
even more firmly to this concept of perseverance when he says in Romans 2, 7, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, eternal life. That crown is glory, honor, and immortality, eternal life. And we win it by perseverance in doing good, in doing God's will, showing our love for him. Finally, the last phrase of John, first, excuse me, of, of James 1.12, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. You know, this really brings our lesson back full circle to this idea of love for God. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 8.3, he says, anyone loves God, he is known by him. And one of the chief ways we show our love for God is by our perseverance in doing his will, in following in the footsteps of Jesus, in being conformed to the image of his dear son. You know, the Apostle Paul talked about those who persevere in their love for God. What are the rich blessings that God has promised them? But he says, I has not seen, neither has ear heard, and which has not entered into the heart of men all the things that God has prepared for those who love him. We can't even imagine what God has prepared for those who win the crown of life. But we will see it. We will receive it if we persevere in our love and our faith in him. But one of the things God has clearly promised, which we don't imagine, but has been clearly stated for us, is that we will be heirs of that kingdom. We will be heirs of that kingdom. We'll be part of a, of a class of priests, a holy nation because we love him. And so in conclusion, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. May we persevere or cheerfully endure the trial of our love for God. May we persevere through every experience that God allows in our loves to prove our love to him. You know, this is our prayer for each one of you, and may the Lord add his blessing.